A comprehension of the content of Riemann's habilitation dissertation is essential for substantial understanding and progress in all important fields of thought. This presentation by Riemann, often treated wrongly as a mathematical presentation, reflects his views on the physical universe and the human mind, and gives us useful insight into understanding social processes. In this video, we'll cover the content of Riemann's presentation and demonstrate an important fact of mental life. Human beings do not sit outside the universe, investigating it from a fixed, stable location, but rather, creative mental activity is itself a universal power and must be considered by anyone who is seeking a universal physical view of the world. Let's dive in. Now you've probably heard that if you add up the angles in a triangle, you get 180 degrees, or two right angles. You've also heard that two parallel lines never cross even if you extend them infinitely. That's quite a claim. This triangle on a sphere has three right angles. And these lines, which seem parallel, actually do cross when they're extended far enough. What would our geometry teacher say? Well, you'd probably hear the response that the rules all work fine if the lines are straight. But let me ask, what does it mean for a line to be straight? Can you think of a definition? Is it perhaps the shortest distance between two points? Well, if so, the lines on our sphere are straight. But the sphere is curved, comes the objection. Make your lines in space. Fine. But how will we make them? Maybe we should use a ruler. Although, how would we know that the ruler was straight? Maybe we should use a beam of light, a physical process, but that won't work because light bends. You see, the problem here is that without realizing it, we all have hypotheses about the nature of space itself, and we have preconceptions about constructions in space, such as making parallel lines. The now famous faker Euclid, he didn't question whether his assumptions were true, he simply wrote out the geometry that corresponded to those assumptions, including the flatness of space, without showing that they were indeed valid. But more egregious than any specific wrong assumptions Euclid may have made was the fact that all of his axioms found their basis only in the a priori thinking of his imagination, not in real physical experiment. In fact, up until Riemann's day, the hypotheses underlying space and geometry had never been examined in a general way. Nor was it recognized that these foundations were actually hypotheses. To make his thoughts clear, Riemann had to offer a general concept of what he called manifolds of various numbers of dimensions and reveal the possible curvatures of these manifolds. Then he could return to the shape of the actual space that we inhabit and decide how and upon what basis it would be distinguished from other possible imaginary spaces. This isn't something to be settled by logic. The answer can only be reached by a continued path of experimentation. So let's delve into the concept of manifolds in general. Start with the concept of magnitude. What is that? Riemann says that a magnitude is a general concept that has multiple specific instances, or ways of being, or specializations. As an example, length is a single concept that has multiple specializations, such as 2 inches, 3 miles, or 5 kilometers. They're all specific lengths. Taste is another example. Salty, sweet, oregano-flavored, those are all specific instances of the general concept of taste. Shoe size, temperature, location, these are all magnitudes. Now, we can distinguish two different kinds of magnitudes, those that change continuously and those which change in discrete jumps. As an example, the tones that can be played on a cello are continuous. <laughs>
while those on a piano are discrete. There is no key on the keyboard between a B and a C, but a cello can vary in between them. We can also consider whether a magnitude's particular specification, or sometimes called mode of determination, whether this particular specification requires one or multiple values. One example is position on the Earth. All lengths can be arranged by size, and you can always say which one is shorter and which one is longer, but the same is not true for position. A location on the Earth has both a latitude and a longitude. And while positions could be arranged by latitude or by longitude, they cannot be arranged by position. The position of New York isn't larger or smaller than the position of Houston. Such magnitudes, or manifolds, for which the fixing of position requires two specifications are said to be doubly extended. For example, specifying the location on any of these different surfaces requires two values. Here you see the sphere, the plane, the monkey saddle, and the catenoid. What's more, the location on a single surface can be specified in several different ways. Here are a variety of different coordinate systems being used to indicate the movement of a spot on a flat plane. While the coordinates are curved, the plane is not. Now, if we move beyond surfaces, a position in space is triply extended. There are many ways of identifying a location in space, but all require at least three specifications. For example, we could give the XYZ position, the latitude, longitude, and altitude, or we could use cylindrical coordinates, or catenoidal ones. Now, these are all different ways of describing a location in space, like the variety of ways of indicating the motion of the spot on the plane. They don't, as coordinate systems, indicate whether the space is curved. So let's go up a level. Just as the plane and the catenoid have different characteristics, and not just different coordinate systems, for example, you can't put a plane on a catenoid, you'd have to bend it and, and stretch it. Can you think of a different kind of space? That is, can you think of a three-dimensional space that isn't flat? It's difficult not to simply think of a curve object in space when you're pondering this question. We're going to return to this later with some more ammunition for strengthening our imagination of curved spaces. As another example, how many dimensions are there in color, as perceived by the human eye? If you're familiar with the way color is represented on televisions and computer monitors, you know that all colors are created by varying amounts of red, green, and blue light, making it three-dimensional. There are many other ways of specifying color, such as YUV, lab color, or hue saturation lightness, seen here but they all use three dimensions. Now, this three-dimensionalness, this triple extension, it's not a character of light itself, but it's a characteristic of the human eye, which contains three different types of color receptors. This can trick you. Mixing red and yellow light together may look orange, but they don't actually become orange light. The red and yellow can be separated back out again with a prism. Another quirk of vision is that magenta light isn't really between red and blue in the color spectrum. Red and blue don't wrap around, except for the way that our mind puts together the experience of our senses. Now, while color is three-dimensional for us, for birds, which have four different color cells, color is four-dimensional. 
And this leads us finally to an example of a magnitude with so many dimensions you can't even count them up. The example is light itself, which has an infinite number of specifications to indicate it exactly. This comes up, for example, when you're matching paint, where the three dimensions of color on a monitor just aren't enough. The paint might match under certain kinds of light, but not others. You can see how the match is better or worse depending on the kind of light. Now here you have the color curve for a certain color of professional light filter. For each possible color, for each possible wavelength in the spectrum, the filter transmits a certain percentage of light. So each of the infinite number of colors in the rainbow has its own unique value of transmittance. Actual light, as opposed to perceived color, doesn't have three, but an infinite number of dimensions. Here you can see the perceived color of a changing color curve. There is so much in light that our eyes cannot distinguish. Now, Armed with these general concepts of magnitudes, we can join Riemann in investigating the different metric relations that manifolds are susceptible of and how they can be determined. What makes a sphere different from a plane? To start our investigation of the internal characteristics of manifolds, we'll start with two-dimensional curved surfaces, and for this we'll use the approach of the great scientist Carl Gauss who chose the topic for Riemann's lecture and was delighted to hear it. Gauss had developed a completely general method for investigating curved surfaces with specific techniques. Now, for example, the sphere is curved while the plane is flat. Here's another curved shape known as a monkey saddle. Unlike the plane, it is curved, but it's not curved the same way that the sphere is curved. But how is it different? Can we quantify its curvature? As a first technique for doing so, we'll introduce the normal. It's a direction at each point on the surface that points directly away from it perpendicularly. We'll use the normals of a surface to measure how curved it is. To do this, Gauss mapped the normals onto an auxiliary sphere. He kept only the direction of the normal, but not its location. You can also imagine the monkey saddle as being shrunk to a tiny size and sitting at the center of the sphere just like we on the Earth are pointing out at distant stars. So watch the directions of the normals as we move around on the surface. Sometimes, when we move to the right on the surface, the direction the normal points moves to the left. So the sphere serves for us as a kind of a three-dimensional compass, allowing us to indicate spatial directions, just like the rim of an ordinary compass tells us our direction on the two-dimensional surface of the Earth. Gauss's first way of measuring the curvature of a surface was to take a region on the surface and compare it to the size of the corresponding region on the auxiliary sphere. The larger the area on the sphere, the more curved the region on the surface. Here, the red region is several times more curved than the blue region. To measure the curvature at a specific point, he would shrink the region down until it was infinitesimally small. And if we use this technique, we find that a cylinder actually has no curvature at all. It would be called flat by Gauss's technique. As we cover this quadrilateral region on the cylinder, the region traced out by the normals is just a straight line with no area, zero curvature. So Gauss's next, his second technique for measuring curvature, uses what are called osculating circles. Now, just like any two points imply a direction if you connect them and draw a line through them, any three points form a circle. So if we pass a plane through a surface, we'll form a curve. And there is a circle that best fits that curve at the given point. Here you can see the series of osculating circles for a given point on the surface. Gauss demonstrated that the most extreme osculating circles are always on planes perpendicular to each other. 
and showed that if you multiply the radii of the two circles and take the inverse, you get the exact same measure of curvature that he had earlier with the normals. Once again, the cylinder has no curvature. One of the two osculating circles is the radius of the cylinder, while the other appears as a straight line with an infinite radius. One divided by the product of these radii is zero. Now before we get to Gauss's third method, which will be the most important for Riemann, we'll take up a specific historical example, figuring out the size of the Earth. To our knowledge, this was first discovered in the third century BC by the one-time librarian of Alexandria, Eratosthenes of Cyrene. He had noticed that on the day of the summer solstice, the sun appeared directly overhead in Aswan, Egypt, today Egypt. And he measured the shadow on the same day of the year in Alexandria. By assuming that the sun was so far away as to make the rays parallel, and by combining the angle of the shadows with the distance between the two cities, he was able to estimate the circumference of the entire Earth as 250,000 stadia, which was a remarkably accurate estimate. A characteristic of the entire planet was determined by making measurements in a small area. So now we're ready to distinguish two different categories of surface characteristics, extrinsic characteristics and intrinsic ones. All the examples given so far have been extrinsic characteristics, which use external objects and positions as references. To contrast intrinsic characteristics, let's pose this. How could Eratosthenes have measured the size of the Earth if the atmosphere was always cloudy, like on Venus? If he only had the surface of the Earth itself and no extrinsic sun to help him, what techniques would lie open for discovering the characteristics of the Earth's surface? Just to make it a little harder, let's say that we ourselves are two-dimensional creatures rather than three-dimensional. A popular example of this is in the book Flatland by E. A. Abbott. This author writes of a world in which only two dimensions exist. The residents are lines, triangles, quadrilaterals, and other polygons, with the leaders having many sides and approaching circular form. But what if there was a mistake? What if Flatland were really sphere land. Each shape moving around on a vast sphere wouldn't notice one spot to be different than another, yet maybe they could still get some clues that something wasn't quite flat. Two such clues are the application of the Pythagorean theorem and displacing directions. So the Pythagorean theorem, it relates three squares that are arranged to form a right triangle. And I think everybody's heard in school that square A plus square B equals square C. But do you know that that's really true? Here we'll form two larger squares by adding a number of equal triangles. These two larger squares are the same size and area. Removing four equal triangles from both, what remains should still also be equal, and so the A and B squares do have the same size as the C square. But as we saw earlier, this is certainly not true on a sphere. Remember our triangle with three right angles? Which side is A, which is B, and which is C? The Pythagorean theorem just doesn't hold here. The way it must be modified is a clue to the surface land polygons. It's a technique for discovering the shape of their world from inside it. But remember, like us trying to imagine curved space, how could they imagine a curved surface? The anomalies tell them what's happening, even though they can't visualize a sphere since it's three-dimensional and they're two-dimensional. A second technique involves direction. You could walk through a town or a building while trying to keep a sense of which way north is by keeping track of all the turns you've made. Here's an example on the plane. But now, let's do the same thing on a sphere. We're moving around on the sphere, and we're always keeping the pointer in the same direction even when we make turns. But now, when we get back to where we started, we're not pointing in the original direction anymore. Let's see that again. Although the pointer isn't being twisted along the way, its direction has still changed. 
So both of these two techniques, the Pythagorean theorem and moving directions, these are intrinsic to the surface. They don't make any reference to anything outside it, even including the concept of space outside it. So in summary, anything the polygon creatures can do or learn is intrinsic. Now Gauss then makes two amazing points. One of them is that none of the intrinsic characteristics change if the surface is bent, as long as you don't stretch it. That is, bending a plane into a cylinder and back doesn't change anything in the surface itself. The distances between two points, the shortest line between two points, angles, everything remains the same. The surface land residents would never even notice. Similarly, the catenoid and the helicoid have the same intrinsic characteristics and are formed from bending one into the other. Gauss's second breakthrough was to come up with a way to measure the curvature at every point intrinsically. So the flat polygons could do this, and the surface could be its own complete world, meaning that giving it a certain shape in space, such as a cylinder versus a plane, is unnecessary. We don't need normals or osculating circles. The surface can be understood from within. Now, this breakthrough is key for Riemann's examination of curved spaces. Triply extended manifolds, such as space, can be curved. But now, we're only able to think of intrinsic curvature, since we can't step outside of space from a fourth dimension to look down on it, the way that we can look down on a doubly extended surface. Instead, we're in the same shoes as our polygon friends for determining the shape of space around us. Riemann, in his paper, gives the most general possible way of determining curvature from within a manifold. It is the anomalous characteristics of action and motion that define the curvature. So with all the possibilities, what is the shape of actual space, as opposed to a mathematical daydream? As we apply these considerations to the actual shape of physical space, let's first contrast the two different concepts of unboundedness and infiniteness, which are often confused. Taking a sphere as an example, motion on the sphere meets with no boundaries, it finds no limits, and yet the sphere is not infinite. It has a total size that is measurable, while motion is unbounded. While space itself appears unbounded in every respect, we can't conclude from this that it is infinite space might be finite. Now, as another consideration, let's ask whether objects are independent of their position. Take as an example the difference between an orange and a watermelon or some other kind of fruit. On the orange, the skin at one location can be moved to another without stretching. There's no difference at all. The parts are all the same. But this isn't the case with our other example. This almost flat region has a certain relationship between the circumference and the area, but here the same circumference has a larger area. So stretching would be involved in moving from one place to the other. To take the example up a dimension, in three dimensions, this would be like moving an orange in space and having the insides get stretched bigger, even while the skin on the outside stays the same size. Maybe we want to avoid that. So we could do that by first hypothesizing that objects are independent of position. That would mean that every portion of space has the same curvature as any other. Now, if that measure were even slightly positive, then space would be finite. This would show up in astronomy, where the same star could appear to be in two opposite directions due to the curved nature of the intervening space, as you see here. Setting out in any direction, you'll always return to your starting point. Even if we didn't go all the way around, the same star could appear on multiple different paths, appearing as a halo rather than a point. But we don't see such duplicated stars or such halos in astronomy, even when we look far away. So if space were uniform, it would have to be flat, or almost entirely so. But what if space isn't uniform? What if objects aren't independent of position? 
What if spatial relations change from place to place? Well, then we couldn't make any inferences about relationships in the small from what we've discovered in the large from astronomy. In fact, in Riemann's day, breakthroughs were being made in chemistry and electromagnetism by hypotheses about the nature of activity on the very small. The metric relations in the small could have all sorts of characteristics, so long as on the very large scales the curvature evened out to the near zero curvature inferred from astronomy. The apparent flatness of geometry on the astronomical scale, as understood in Riemann's day, has no inherent truth on the micro scale. So how can we figure out the small scale metric relationships? In what way is space curved? And more importantly, how can we discover why it's curved as it is? In a discrete manifold, the basis of metric relations is contained in the concept of the manifold itself, while it must come from elsewhere in the case of a continuous manifold. And to clarify that, whenever you name or conceptualize a discrete manifold, such as the keys on a keyboard or the people in a room, you've already given the means of measurement with the conception of the manifold. But in a continuous manifold, such as length or position, you're given no idea of what the space is like or how measurements ought to be made. Riemann continues, either then the reality underlying space must form a discrete manifold, or the basis of metric relations must be sought for outside it in the binding forces that operate upon it. Yes, exactly. The basis for anything, its sufficient reason for being as it is rather than otherwise, doesn't lie in making observations of it. Seems like Riemann's investigation won't end with the final conclusion. In fact, Riemann finishes his lecture with the limits of armchair mathematical theorizing. While studies such as his can remove unjustified presumptions, they can't really make affirmative conclusions. Riemann closes, this leads us into the domain of another science, the realm of physics, into which the nature of the present occasion does not permit us to enter. So we'll now leave mathematics behind and venture into the realm of physics, the realm of reality. To start our investigation in the realm of physics, we'll consider Johannes Kepler and the birth of astrophysics. Kepler entered a field that had been studied on the basis of understanding nature from the standpoint of the senses. Very explicitly, his predecessors had put forward various models for the planetary system based upon saving appearances. That is, their goal was to cause their models to present the same impression to the senses as the real planets do. Kepler proved that even as they chased appearances, the models were always wrong because of their method. And furthermore, he knew that even a wrong hypothesis could look like the truth. He wrote about his own vicarious hypothesis that, further, the lack of any perceptible difference in the effects between the as yet unknown true hypothesis and the false one assumed by us, that does not make the effects identical for there can be a small discrepancy which the senses do not perceive. Now, there will always be things we haven't measured. Even if our model matches observations perfectly, that doesn't mean it's true. Not just because the observations will get better in the future, but because matching observations, although necessary, is never itself the standard of truth. Although Kepler made a working mathematical model for the planets, he wasn't content without a hypothesis of the purpose lying behind their motions. Why do they move the way that they do? In his new astronomy, he hypothesized that a power in the sun caused the motions. In his Harmonies of the World, he details the harmonic principles of composition that required the specific orbits displayed by the planets. In this case, cause is purpose. It is a why, rather than a what or a how. Newton's inverse square generalization may describe how motion changes from moment to moment, but not why, as Newton himself admitted. Kepler demonstrated the failure of mathematics, and he succeeded as a scientist. 
his simple, beautiful question, why is it so, rather than otherwise, moved him beyond inductive generalizations of a world as according to sense impression and into a conception of the world as composed on the principles of beauty, as rigorous as they are free. Pierre de Fermat demonstrated the value of purpose as a scientific concept. The refractive bending of light as it moves from one material to another had puzzled thinkers for centuries. Why does light bend the way that it does when it enters water, for example? Fermat discovered the principle of least time. Among all the paths light might have taken from its origin to its destination, the paths it follows are those that make the journey the quickest. In this case, least time is nothing sense perceptual. It has the character of a motive, not an appearance. Gottfried Leibniz demonstrated that the assumption of an a priori independent space and time led to absurdities. When the Newtonian Samuel Clark tried to demonstrate God's great power in the free choice that God had in deciding where to put everything at the moment of creation, Leibniz responded that that's no decision at all. Moving the universe two feet to the right is the same as moving space two feet to the left. The relations between objects wouldn't change at all. Nothing would ever know. It has absolutely no meaning. The absurdity arises from the assumption of a space prior to and independent of things to be related in space. There is no absolute space. This is also seen when you compare Descartes' laws of motion with those of Leibniz. Descartes' biggest problem, well, one of his biggest problems, is that he believes in absolute motion and absolute rest, which drove him to conclusions that are just really nuts. Leibniz knew that motions are only relative. While the cause of the motions could be real and absolute, physics must be the foundation of geometry, and that was the basis of Leibniz's development of the infinitesimal calculus. Take Albert Einstein. His theory of relativity discards distinct geometric time and space, instead using the physical process of light propagation to give a physical meaning to space-time. And in doing so, he showed how space-times differ for different observers. They exist as action spaces, not geometric spaces. Physical action is primary and geometries are created to reflect our hypotheses of the true relations between unfolding actions in the universe. You gotta make geometry match the physics, not the other way around. Today, Einstein's general theory of relativity is the most commonly cited example of curved spacetime, although not always cited correctly. Now move to biology and beyond. Vladimir Vernadsky's passionate search for understanding the nature of life and cognition led him to hunt for geometries that were capable of expressing activities of life that he knew simply could not exist in a Euclidean space. One example is the chirality, the handedness of living processes. Pasteur and Curie had demonstrated that unlike abiotic processes, living processes showed a preference between left and right-handed versions of the same molecule a preference which could not exist in simple Euclidean space. Vernadsky also wrote much about the different kind of living time, distinct from abiotic time. In evolutionary living time, for example, before and after are not merely distinguished chronologically as before being not after and after being the opposite of before, but rather after is fundamentally different than before it is a time in which new, higher developments of life processes exist. This is seen even more strongly in human time. In our economic time, the power of the human species, and we are ourselves a physical force, this power changes categorically with new discoveries of principle. Economic times differ qualitatively, not quantitatively. And such human time doesn't just happen like the ticking of a clock. It has to be created through discovery driven by passion. This is the space-time of economic development. So Euclid wasn't just wrong in his specific axioms. Any different geometry, starting with geometric axioms, rather than the principles that shape real physical action, 
any such geometry would err as well. With Riemann, geometry itself completely changes its meaning. It isn't the stage upon which events unfold. It is the shape of the action itself. What can we say about the process of gaining knowledge about this shape? Is our goal an ultimate understanding of nature, which we observe, hypothesize, and approach as if asymptotically, although never reaching this ultimate knowledge? No. We are a part of what we're studying. Consider the most powerful of all physical forces, the human mind. Creative thought is a physical force. It has physical effects, just like electromagnetism, plasma, biological processes. A true Riemannian geometry, based firmly on the principles that lie behind perceived appearances, must take creative mind into account. Our goal isn't a final geometry of a world out there. It must include the developing powers of reason, the kernel of economic development. There must be no separation between physics and the study of the mind. Physical science that rejects mind can never find true principles, but will always be stuck in a bog of statistical induction and correlation based on the senses. Similarly, social philosophy or sociology, which isn't informed by the study of fertile scientific thought, will become a study of neuroses or pedestrian irrelevancies with a complete lack of any useful direction. There is only one world to discover and act on. Mind discovers, mind acts, mind creates. Riemann brings us into reality and shows that the principles underlying reality cohere with the mind. Now, while he concluded his lecture with the need to abandon mathematics for physics, to truly achieve Riemann's program, we must go beyond physics to economics. We must include the progressing development of the powers of the human mind. Thus, the importance of Riemann for economic science.